Next, we are going to hear from Dr. Ed Cording, who will be talking to us about his interactions with Ralph Peck. And as I indicated previously, uh, Ed is a professor emeritus from the University of Illinois and remains very, very active as a consultant tunneling underground construction. This was truly pioneering work. It was the first time that observations of tunnel construction were linked with ground movements around the tunnel and then translated to evaluate the surface settlements. The approach is as valid today as it was 70 years ago. For our pressurized shield technology, we are using different techniques for making measurements and different methods of tunneling, but it's still a key to understanding and controlling the ground on our projects. And what is often missing on projects, even with some of the sophisticated instrumentation and tunneling methods we have, what is often missing is that link between the construction observations and our instrumentation. <clears throat> Professor Mesri described uh, Carl Terzaghi's, uh, excuse me, Ralph Peck's history as he uh, came to, uh, before he came to the Chicago subway and as he came to the Chicago subway. In December 1938, Carl Terzaghi lectured in Chicago on the dangers of constructing subways in soft clays <coughs> beneath large cities. His descriptions of the consequences of tunneling were so graphic that he found both the State Street Property Owners Association and the Department of Subways and Traction of the City of, of Chicago seeking his services. He obviously chose the city because that would be where the action would be and where you could make the contributions. As Peck would note in his lectures, Terzaghi figuratively scared the audience to death and he received the consulting assignment. He chose Ralph Peck, who was at Harvard. Uh, he came to uh, Chicago as assistant subway engineer, city of Chicago, Department of Subways and Traction, and supervised the soil mechanics lab that Terzaghi uh, had stated was one of the requirements of his consulting assignment. <clears throat> one of the early questions that came up during the uh, investigations as Terzaghi got into the project uh, along with Peck was what should be done to reduce the settlements of the street surface, the surface of the street to a minimum. And uh, in response to that, uh, Terzaghi recommended a squeeze test, a, a method of evaluating construction the, during the construction process. The primary objective then was to link the construction to the surface settlement. And the squeeze test then became a major effort of Peck's soil mechanics team. They did continuous observation of the excavation support cycles, 24 to 48 hour periods as the heading was advanced some 20 to 40 feet ahead of the concreting and then uh, the next sequence would be bringing the concreting forward under air pressures ranging typically from 12 to 14 psi, less than the 15 psi that would require major changes uh, in um, the, the time that uh, the, the miners could be underground. <coughs> The um, top heading here is uh, two teams of, of miners and muckers, the people that are handling the muck that's being cut by the clay knives and uh, removed from the tunnel heading. The temporary braces support the ribs and the, uh, the, top, the ribs in the top. And here you can see the top face. And we'll just go through the sequence. All of this is happening within a distance about 20 feet from the front of the tunnel, or should be. Uh, in some cases, it's stretched out uh, to the uh, negative uh, result uh, that you would get larger settlements. Spearheads were driven ahead of the face, and those are what we really refer to as squeeze tests when they measure the horizontal displacements. Rods driven into the crown to measure settlement. Then they would undermine the arch rib and place the steel so support below the arch rib. Uh, excavate the intermediate face, drive rods into the clay on the walls, and measure with tape a measure across the width of the tunnel. Lower face, 
excavate the lower face and then then bring the concrete invert forward and and, and finally steel forms to set the concrete arch. But, but think about this in terms of the way you make observations. They are watching the entire cycle. They're not just making measurements in the tunnel. They're watching the entire cycle. They're locating and evaluating the conditions uh, uh, of the tunneling. Where is the face? Uh, what, what's the location of the various benches? What type of, me what method are the, is the, are the miners using to fill the gap between the lining they place and the clay they have excavated? That's really, to me, the start of the observational method. It's not just observing measurements, it's observing that construction and linking the two. And then they were able to equate the volume of ground lost into the tunnel with the volume of surface sediment. <laughs> Here we are on contract S5, where it was the first, well, some of the first tests they ran, and they had very large settlements at the surface that were in the range of 5.6 inches. And this is the, these are the results that were being obtained uh, at the re request of Trzaghi. Peck went out and, and developed this plan for con collecting the information. And he put it on one drawing. Now, it wasn't uh, a normal 8.5 by 11. Of course, it was an engineering drawing. But he put all that data on it. This is a portion of that drawing. It summarizes the excavation sequence, the soil properties uh, on the right side of that diagram, the ground loss, which is measured by the crown settlement, and the wall closure at the bottom. And then uh, <coughs> the surface settlements were on another part of this drawing that I showed in the previous slide. And it was interesting because Terzaghi, or Peck had, um, Two, thing, two comments that he would make in his lectures about this process. He said, first of all, that when he brought the, the, the drawings, Terzaghi came on his next visit, he brought the drawings and he had a, a written report that was usually about three pages, not one, uh, of the actual observations and showed it to Terzaghi and he said Terzaghi concealed his pleasure at these results with some difficulty. And it, 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 Peck noted the growing um, uh, confidence they had in their collaboration. And, uh, but there was one other thing that he would say, and, and it was basically the lessons learned. And this was, the, the way he plotted, Peck plotted the data was with these curves coming down, smooth curves, and Terzaghi evaluated that in later months and found out that, uh, determined that those were actually real changes and the curves should be drawn to follow the fact that the displacements occurred in the crown, and as the sidewalk uh, moved in, it would move the crown up at least temporarily. And, and Terzaghi uh, would made this statement, that which Peck would conclude with the, this admonition, you should assume the data is right until you have proven that it is wrong. On the first contract, uh, with this type of tunneling, they were getting three to six inches of settlement, and the observations showed that the settlements were occurring due to the undermining of the ribs, overall settlement, incomplete filling of the gap between the clay and the lining. And so they put in um, a, a monkey drift, a so-called monkey drift, where they put wall plate in, uh, a, a wall beam on the side, and that then was, uh, served as a base for the arch to be placed such that when they undermined it that wall being transferred load laterally or longitudinally in such a way that they then could set the posts without having settlement. So the rest of the projects were with this method and this is well described in Terzaghi's paper in uh, 1942 on liner plate tunnel method. <clears throat> The other thing that was happening, and as they moved forward, the, the, the team was really being used as kind of an emergency response team to respond to problems that were occurring on the projects. And so, uh, what I showed there, number one and two, were the, uh, the, the examples uh, that we just described. But then they had a situation where they were tunneling back towards the Chicago River on the on item four there, and they were going deeper to get under the river, at least the approaches to get down to the river. And so this was resulting in uh, additional settlement, and Ralph Burke, Burke the chief engineer, said, uh, asked the team to evaluate why they were getting so much settlement. They'd gotten a better method of tunneling now with the monkey drifts, but they were getting large settlements. And so, <coughs> 
Peck went in and uh, along with his team, but he wrote a report that summarized that information. And so what, what he really concluded here was that there was an excessive gap of two to seven inches, that the pea gravel was being delayed back that fill in, to fill in that gap, and that the intermediate face um, that was to be excavated so that they could put in the strut was being delayed so that lateral strut was not in place and the displacements were occurring into the tunnel. Um, it, and this was, I, I obtained this information from a, a copy of the original carbon copies and the drawings that had been prepared uh, by the, the team. And it, what stands out in reviewing those squeeze reports is the level of detail, the relevant detail in the recorded observations and, and the, the focus on solving a real problem. So to me, that was a, to see that was a, seeing the start of uh, Peck's approach to uh, the engineering practice. Over almost that three-year construction period on the Chicago subway, Peck used the observational method in solving those subway construction problems. And so we had a situation here where he found that, that when they got down to the deep tunnel, on the, uh, the deepest tunnel there, they were getting large settlements, but the same crew at the same time was advancing the other tunnel on alternate shifts, and they were getting much smaller movements. And it was had to do with the fact that they were getting larger stresses uh, at, at greater depth. And so you, just a plot of this overstress ratio, of the, uh, which is a function of the depth and the air pressure, you get this increasing settlement with uh, over this overstress ratio. And, and the air pressure there had to be maintained at less than 15 PSI. So when you go deeper, you had a situation where the air pressure was, <coughs> could not be increased and you got larger settlements. But what then did happen was that um, as they corrected this and continued going even deeper, they reduced those settlements dramatically. And so they got that uh, the gap that was decreased such that they weren't supporting this with just the air pressure, but were really uh, supporting it with the lining itself. And they, so they improved that, that method. That's something that I hadn't seen in the literature, and, but it really showed uh, how Peck was evaluating and, and, and looking at the behavior. So this was his summary, a little hard to read from here, but um, he summarized what needed to be done, and that was what they, they did accomplish. Peck at the conference in 99 said this, this project assumed an importance far beyond its benefits at the time. And the, large, the enormous practical benefits that can occur from even crude observations. Even today it ex exemplifies the benefits that may de be derived from simple but intelligently interpreted observations. So we are, have now the pressurized systems. We can put a pressure envelope around the machine, uh, tunneling in free air, but the full pressurization. We, we don't have the opportunity to make measurements in the face because it's hidden by the cutting wheel. And we, we have to rely on the instrumentation uh, of the key machine functions with time. But those are key, again, they're key functions that are related to the ground movements, and those have to be integrated in our projects. They have to put those together. Now here's one project, recent project, and we had here uh, settlements that you can see going from uh, in a test section before we went under a building. Settlements ranging, from, uh, this is just above the tunnel, ranging from one uh, to two to three to four on the left, on the bottom, as the tunnel advanced to the left, and one to two to four, uh, one to two on the, on the other tunnel. And uh, these measurements are in millimeters. And this is where we are with our current technology, <coughs> not inches. And we're, we're moving forward with large diameter tunnels. And the reason we can do that is because we can tie together the observations um, and the monitoring of the machine functions. We will have, for the Alaskan Way viaduct, a 1,000 foot test section before we dive underneath the viaduct. <coughs> 
and we have to, in that period, have to be able to prove out the machine and its ability to advance without causing significant ground loss. Peck's statement in 99 at our conference at Illinois, uh, I, I went back and saw it. I hadn't recalled it, but he uh, went back to the, the, the paper. He gave the keynote address there. I've had a 60-year love affair with subway tunnels. The state of the art has changed radic radically, but the rate of change <coughs> has not percept perceptibly decreased. Most of the changes have not been driven by advances in theory, but by observations based on experience. And for some of us, our love affair with subways and observation really began in class. My first case history was the Chicago subway, obviously years <coughs> uh, after it had been conducted. Uh, we, and over the years, we and our other colleagues have had the opportunity to work with Peck uh, on many projects, uh, including subway projects. And certainly, uh, for those of us who had that privilege, his presence is missed, uh, his lessons remain, and in commemorating his legacy, we remind ourselves and we introduce to others the lessons he learned and he taught to the profession. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat>